Hi, everybody. Welcome to episode 10 of Demand Decoded, where we'll be talking about marketing strategies for the opt out era. Thanks for tuning in. We appreciate, as always, you taking the time to join us. And uh, I'm Phil, and today I'm joined by Amanda McGrath, our commercial director at Blend. Hi, Amanda. How are you? I'm really well. Thanks, Phil. How are you? Very well. Thank you. Looking forward to this. Um, Good. Audience, please feel free to ask questions as we go. Um, we'll answer them as we go along. So just drop your comments into the feed in the comments and we'll pick them up and we'll discuss them live. Thanks very much. So let's kick things off, Amanda. Let's start, uh, as we normally do, by setting the scene. What do we mean by the opt out era and why is it an important topic now? So I think this is really important because People think of opt out and I think they really think of two areas. They think of email marketing and think of cookies. But when we've been chatting about it, opt out is really going beyond that. It's in ad blocking. It's in banner blindness. It's people just not engaging. Um, mm -hmm. It's It goes further into things like sensitivity to data sharing, awareness that your data is being monetized. Um, and ultimately, that all leads to a sense uh, in marketing, I think, that we can't assume that opt-ins exist anymore um, and that they maybe shouldn't be what we're going after at all. And then I suppose why now? Well, partly because this is what's happening right now, obviously. You know, we've seen a lot of changes over the last few years in legislation and obviously in behavior as well. Um, but this is happening and it's not really being talked about in a large scale. It's actually been over 20 years since Seth Godin published Permission Marketing and 14 years since Inbound Marketing published um, with uh, with Darmesh and Brian from HubSpot. What's the text that talks about this now and talks about the situation we're in? It does seem to be missing. So much has changed and we absolutely need to accept that it will continue to change. There are new mediums, new behaviours that we're seeing all the time. This is happening as we speak, but we're not addressing it directly or strongly enough. So I think that's why this is so important right now. That's really interesting. The fact you know, to think about opt in or not opting in beyond the checkbox to uh, being a set of behaviours across channels mm -hmm. and across you know marketing in general that buyers are displaying, I think really you know uh, sort of lifts the lid on a hot topic like you say and wow so long since those pivotal you know pieces came out and yeah nothing really has come along to update refresh or replace those um, except maybe it's time for the inbound demand generation book to get written um, you <laughs> yeah, know, to address the changes we're seeing in the marketplace but you no know, i agree i agree with you that's really really interesting so so going deeper why do buyers behave differently today what, why are they choosing to opt out? Mm, I think, I mean, it all comes down to awareness, doesn't it? We're all so much more aware of what happens when we give away our data. We know, and we know as well, that if we're not paying for something, we are probably how it is being paid for. Our data, our presence on a platform is how people are earning their money or, you know, um, getting their views and their reach and that is that doesn't sit right with a lot of us we care about our privacy we understand our privacy and its boundaries more than ever and we understand how it's being infringed all the time so it's really natural i think for every person be they wanting to buy right now or not to want to remain anonymous until they're actually ready to talk to a business or um an organization now that I think does make it really hard for people trying to create content or to market themselves to to get engagement. It means that a lot of the things that we relied on in the past may not work anymore. Um, but trying to, to go against that tide doesn't doesn't sit right because how do you feel when you are intruded on or I mean, how do you behave when you're online? I know I know for a fact with just just myself. I purposefully skip ads. I am banner blind. I, you know, I, I have that blinkered view of anything that I perceive to be being an ad. I will move past it and move on. So it's really important that in the ideas I bring to marketing that I respect the fact that other people will make those kind of decisions. I think that's really interesting. And going back to your earlier point, you know, the choice to remain anonymous, to, to 
hold on to anonymity, you know, can be bigger than not checking a box or not converting in the first place. It can also be, you know, not not creating a measurable, trackable event, you know, <laughs> by accepting cookies or clicking on certain ads or navigating away from their feed or so on. Um, on that topic or on a re related topic, hot off the out of the gates, Frank's got a question for us. Um, let's have a look. What do you do if website visitors don't accept cookies? For example, do you run retargeting ads on the business IP address instead? There's a few questions in there. And I think the fundamental one is this like, you know, what do we do if businesses don't accept cookies? What, what do you think should be our reaction to that? I mean, I think that the idea of using IP address uh, could be valid. I think if there are two ways to approach this, one is ultimately, yes, you want to still try and use the same tactics and find the way around them. I do, I do absolutely understand that desire. But I think one of the things I think is so important is actually thinking about the fact that if what you give your website visitors is valuable enough, they will come back. People remember website URLs. People remember where they got good content. There's nothing more obnoxious, I think, in my experience, than being chased by something you've already purchased or that you intend to purchase anyway. Um, it, you know, in the kind of experience sense, it almost smacks of desperation. So while I do think retargeting is really important, especially in environments where you might have a long buying cycle and people may, you know, may be considering lots of options and you want to remind them that you're part of that, actually focusing your efforts on people coming back organically, you know, on, of their own volition, because what you've done or given them stands out, actually, I think is just as important, if not more so, than the retargeting in the first place. But Phil, do you have any ideas um, that address uh, Frank's question more directly? Well, I don't know about more directly, but I think what I've heard in your statement is, you know, if, if visitors don't accept cookies, accept it. It's really interesting, isn't it, that generally as individuals, we advocate for the right to do things privately without being hounded targeted you know without our data being scraped sold abused and then we had put on our marketing hats and we go to extreme lengths to try to subvert that process um and in general you know having seen the potential of earlier on inbound marketing and now inbound demand generation to get buyers to come to you willingly and raise the hand i really sort of you know have doubts about the uh, validity or the you know usefulness of things like intent data and you know alternative forms of audience building and i mean you know google themselves are going to be removing third-party cookies from browsers while simultaneously trying to concoct new ways to target those very same people with an iota more privacy in mind so it's a constant game to really just subvert people's right to privacy i don't like that i'd rather get mm -hmm. them to come again and again and again to to our estate to consume what we have to offer and when ready buy from us so my answer would be if you can run really targeting ads on business ip addresses and drive a good roi then by all means do so it's probably legal and you're free to do it but you know people not accepting cookies is a growing trend it's a it's one of the the negative consequences of gdpr um, and so it's best to simply embrace and accept these things that buyers want and build strategies around them, which I think we'll we'll move on to in in, in this conversation. Um, that neatly brings us onto the point of GDPR, which I think is a factor. And from my perspective, you know, I think it's really a bit of a failed exercise. And now, who am I to say that? I suppose the EU knows a thing or two that I don't. But you know, accounts of the impact of GDPR are largely that it's had more unintended negative consequences on EU businesses and consumers and buyers than intended consequences and positives, you know, and instead of rather than getting people to think more carefully about who they trust with their data and what they want in return, it's just produced these like sweeping changes in behavior, you know, everybody's giving people, you know, consent for cookies and consent for processing because one opting in and out of individual cookies is too laborious when you're doing it a hundred times a day. So everyone's just like, yeah, accept all. And processing in B2B is rarely an option. So everybody's still got your data and mm -hmm. you're trusting them to secure it. 
and we know that's incredibly hard. But the bit that you are given control over, opting into communications, check this box to receive marketing comms, we're all taking back our right not to do that. So if you're presenting the option, buyers are just going to skip over that because why? Why would they agree to receive those messages in, in many cases? So GDPR has, I think, exacerbated the behaviours that would probably happen anyway and, and meant they're much more pre prevalent right now than they would have otherwise been, perhaps. I think actually that raises that that point on cookies that you mentioned raises a really good point. It's really hard to opt out of cookies. So can you assume that your opt ins are earned? Mm. Possibly not. If you're making it such a, a pain for people to opt out, then you are probably getting people opting in who don't actually want to. And that is I, I again, I think, as, as you say, you know, when we think about ourselves and individuals and how we want to be treated, we believe we have the right to privacy. I don't think there's anyone who doesn't really fundamentally think that they are the, have the right to be a private individual. And yet we are forcing people to jump through hoops to retain the right to their privacy. We are, you know, and, and really beyond beyond cookies, has anything really changed? Do any of us get fewer spam emails from people they never asked to be contacted by i don't think i do i think i get more um i you know it it it's it's aggravating and it's it's it feels unnecessary frankly because there's so much that you know as, as you say when you when what you produce is of high enough quality you earn the right for what well, you earn people's desire to come back to you and you earn when they do want you to the right to contact them usually because they're interested in working with you in some fashion or using your product or service so yeah i think i think there's a lot in that you know that gdpr piece so gdpr hasn't had the positive impact on people's lives where they feel like they're being less bombarded and actually what it's ended up introducing is a situation where people are having to jump through more hoops to maintain their privacy than they should have to so many good points in that. I mean, I think the fact that GDPR raises questions around the, you know, the quality of every bit of data you've got that's controlled by GDPR, very, very uh, pertinent. Um, it was 2018, wasn't it, when GDPR was uh, implemented? Yes. And, you know, I was going back today over some articles, some fairly well researched articles from just 2019, you know, examining the, the unintended consequences, you know, it, the fact that from a consumer perspective, and it really is targeted at consumers, they haven't perceived an improvement in the amount of spam and the amount of breaches they're part of. And, you know, it hasn't improved anything for them. It's just made their use of the web harder. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, furthermore, on the global scale, you know, EU businesses are at a disadvantage because they're having to implement all these things, you know, compared to certain other parts of the world. And their access to information is impaired as well because other websites are blocked from the EU because they mm -hmm. can't comply with it. GDPR. So, yeah, really, really is a, a, um, a bit of a frustrating state of affairs. And given that, you know, like you said, permission marketing, you know, a, a piece of uh, a piece of work, you know, focused on ditching the uh, interruption based methods, you know, the the, the, the non permission and saying, let's get people's permission to communicate with them. 1999. Brilliant. Inbound marketing, largely an evolution of the permission based uh, mindset. Let's give people knowledge and value and earn the right to communicate with them and inbound demand generation being a bit of an evolution of that. So, well, you know, permission has changed, opt-in has changed. So let's market in ways that buyers respond to earn it. Um, yeah. The, and so we go on uh, just, we could go on that forever, but let's move on to. Uh, we John. could, there's one thing I would also say about it, which is one of the things that people forget about opt-in, permission etc is permission marketing when it came out positioned itself as an ethical approach you know this is about understanding the ethics of people's right to decide whether they get communications from you or not that ethical point i think needs to go further right now to a really true sense and understanding that people have a right to privacy and have a right to decide when you can when when they want to to hear from you um and i don't think 
the current situation from you know in the marketing in many companies actually truly takes that into account i think people are still trying to trick people or make it too hard for them to keep keep their privacy and that yeah. is that's well personally i think that's not the ethical approach that we should be taking yeah i think when you see a for example a cookie consent banner which is 10 12 15 or more individual controls for things that most people really don't care about or understand functional navigational you know required not required like that that's really an exercise in sort of um you know deterring free free thought and free action isn't it it's it's mm -hmm. done in the hope that people simply go ah can't be bothered with that skip it and we do you know and you know on the point of gdpr has not reduced or improved the uh, experience for people vis-a-vis -vis spam from people who simply don't care to observe gdpr has caused all these behaviors that negatively affect those that do follow gdpr um, you know or try to anyway if you can even know mm. what gdpr is because of course it's very great yeah maddening to say the least flipping it looking at it from the other perspective why do businesses that want to target the modern buyer need to move beyond opt-in let's look at it from the positive mm. side yeah absolutely i think you know looking at it from the more positive side it feels to me and i know to other people like there's quite a general trend or tide of rethinking a lot of areas of life and thought around this idea that you know you people do not want to be tricked or pushed into doing things against their will so why not embrace and empathize and understand what they're looking for so wh why not go with the momentum that's already there R rather than pushing against the tide of someone else's someone's desire you know to behave in a certain way or you know do certain things why not understand them empathize with them and go with it make it easy for them to behave the way that they want to behave so that's why you know making it simple for if people want to opt out of course they can they should they should be able to um but when people want to raise their hand don't make them jump through hoops to do so you know when they want to say i'm ready to talk to someone about this product this service i'd like to buy now please don't make it hard think about how you can make it easier for them you're going to get a much better experience for them which will lead into them doing more business with you mm -hmm. um, and before that as well earlier in the marketing journey thinking about the kinds of content that people want to receive the kinds of value that you can ultimately create for them that's going to be what attracts them to you the quality of what you put out into the world that positive piece is so so important um when we were talking about this um earlier last week we were talking i was i was mentioning I subscribe to YouTube channels, things that I really enjoy, but I also don't need that subscription to remember to go and look at the videos. I know they're gonna post a couple of times a week. I'm gonna make sure I catch up with them, their cooking channels, whatever they are. When something is valuable, people seek it out. You know, they, they, they do remember, they look for the things that are useful to them. So, so what makes something valuable? Embrace that, you know, think about the things that Think about, think about the kinds of content that are going to be useful to people and making sure that the format is right as well. So, you know, what's the content? What's the format? Um, make sure it's in the right location as well. Where do the people that you want to speak to look for things that interest them? Providing value there is the perfect thing to do. And in our case, you know, obviously it's, it's content about things that we're passionate about in marketing and we put that on LinkedIn because we know that's where our audience are digesting a lot of content. Um, I think that's really, what's really key there is that piece about understanding, empathy, um, and how we get to that, you know, I think can be difficult. How do you, how do you know what's going to be valuable and where's the best place to put it when things might be changing? You might be finding that there aren't as many keywords or that keywords are too competitive. So maybe search is no longer for you. Um, 
or you might be finding that people are researching their topics in completely different ways or embracing all sorts of different channels. How are you going to find that out? I think a lot of it comes down to qualitative research. If you can interview people who you don't already know, that's great. But every business has the potential of information in its existing customer base. Just asking people, you know, when you're researching new topics, where do you do it? What kinds of things do you find engaging? They're really mm-hmm. simple questions, but actually there's going to be a mi- uh, an absolute mine, a treasure trove of information in that, things that you had never thought of. Yeah. Yeah. So B2B marketing and empathy don't aren't don't have to be mutually exclusive. Right. Uh, I'm hearing. Um, no. But maybe perform maybe empathy and performance marketing are somewhat mutually exclusive. Do you think these changes impact our general obsession with performance based methods? I think so. But then again, we talked previously on this podcast about the difference between the metrics that matter and vanity metrics. You know, we jokingly called it sanity metrics versus vanity metrics. But the truth of the matter is what really matters to your business is the number of people who inquire. You know, it is that demand piece. Many of the other metrics that marketers have been pouring their energy, you know, into reporting on and showing, show, trying to prove it their value to their organizations are influencing metrics, are, you know, maybe not even, maybe they are just, they are just vanity metrics, pure and simple. Um, but ultimately, maybe it's going to be a lot simpler for marketers if they've just got their eye on the prize, the demand of people saying, yes, please, I'm the one that you want to be talking to. Um, And then working on the tactics to see where they can influence that number is going to be important. And and ultimately as well, a lot of those metrics are going to be disappearing. They already are as people Mm -hmm. opt out. So, So continuing to look at them is a bit is a bit like looking at the hole in a sinking ship. (laughs) <laughs> okay yeah that's a that's a that's what that's a good way of putting it yeah um although sinking ships obviously not a fun topic um the i think you know when you think about platforms and you know the platforms that have been embraced to such a huge extent and 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 yet all the optimization is around the metrics that are available within that platform as opposed to the one that really matters which is in the pipeline for example it's a mindset shift to start to optimize the use of those channels and platforms around a metric that can't be reported on there, may not be reported on immediately or ever, but you know the positive impact is, is elsewhere. So moving to um, you know, the actionable sort of ideas for how people can make the change and adapt and adopt to you know, embrace this reality that's, that's gonna happen whether we like it or not. If you're not gonna get buyers to opt in and as you've already made made sort of the point, there's a lot of versions of what opt-in is. How can you engage them effectively, successfully, and and drive your result? I think fundamental to performance of the future is creating value for the people that you want to be talking to, um, and providing that value in a way that is respectful of their right to privacy and empathetic to the ways in which they want to behave. So ultimately, making sure what you are creating is valuable enough that people want to come back to it on their own is the key, as we've kind of said a few times now. Um, And then where is it, you know, and what's the format of it? Creating value in itself is a big topic. I think it's probably a topic for another day, but really looking at yourself as an organization and thinking about what's the most what's the most value that, that you can provide to your target audience. Um, it is a classic content marketing approach because content marketing, you know, does or offers people what your service or product does even better. It is putting out there the information that people need to educate themselves that then leads to them naturally being able to make a more informed decision. So true content marketing and marketing that has real value is, I think, the key. How people can go about generating that is probably too big a discussion for today. Um, Mm -hmm. But then right place, right time, right format. 
Yeah, the the power of content marketing was uh, you know was never in the measurability of it necessarily, right? It was about providing something that your buyer wanted. Measurability is something that we sought and brought into the process. And in fact, marketing, you know, marketing communications is not about measuring, you know, what people do or how and when they do it. It's about communicating a proposition effectively, uh, you know, to to acquire an audience and and to drive demand. At the end of the day, everything else is is something that marketers have added into the mix mm. mainly because platforms have been very effective at monetizing you know their audience us like you said mm-hmm. um, and they produced probably a somewhat of a mixed you know a mixed change positive in some ways i'm sure but negative in others and I, there are you know there are people in the industry that are very vocal about the best marketing not being you know done for clicks not being mm-hmm. done for measurable reasons it's about creating emotion um you know creating strong brand affinity and conviction and I, I i agree with all of that and i think you're free to do that when you think about marketing as a way to create demand as opposed to create a certain cpc or a, you know hit a hit a click target or an impression target i think yeah i think we have to be really empathetic to marketers because it is a big shift but again it's it is where things are going. There is less data to work with and spending the time, much as we saw a few years ago where you know we really started to notice and, and realize that things like lead scoring weren't accurate predictors of people's behavior. If we can't predict people's behavior, you know, trying to map it on a multi-attribute report with loads and loads of different facets, it almost feels like it's just, it's just trying to manipulate the figures when you get to that simple bottom line adjacent metric of are we providing sales with people to talk to and then getting that feedback of are these the right people to talk to it's much simpler but it is going to be a shift it does mean downing tools on things that people have worked with for years and changing the way that they talk to their organizations about them. That might be painful, but again, this is about embracing, the, all of this is ultimately around embracing the change in buyer behavior and not trying to fight it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Accept it, embrace it, don't resist it, and uh, mm-hmm. you'll, you'll be future-proofing your efforts ultimately, because you know, if, you, if you fight the flow, then you're gonna get less and less results. And you know, truth be told, most stats around methods that whilst they might have been effective a couple of years back but uh, you know unless but, but they talk about decline in you know number of calls connected number of meetings set number of leads converted etc cetera, etc cetera. those things are all going south whereas you know people buyers desire for in public and therefore sort of less partial content is is growing and how they find it is changing too but fortunately, it's not hard to adapt to that either, because you can usually quite easily find out where your audience is, ask them, experiment. You know, there aren't a million choices. There's only a, you know, a handful of very, very popular platforms, for example, um, and go there. Yeah, don't resist the change. A question that I hear a lot internally in Blend, and I, I half expected us to get from our audience, but um, a really interesting one. So should should marketers create an email list at all? Should they bother? I think there's no harm in leaving the function there for people to subscribe if they want to, because some people do still use it as a way of keeping track of content that they're interested in. But I think we need to flip the script on it and stop seeing it as something that we are going to measure our performance on and start seeing it as a content service that we provide you know we make it easy for you to subscribe to us we're not going to push it we're not going to try and force it down your throat because we accept the fact that we can't change what you're going to do or how you're going to do it we're not going to take that functionality away from you if it's something you want to use yeah yeah it's a it's yeah i agree with that it's uh, it's a channel by which people can consume our content um, it's a good idea to make it available and optional. There's no harm in having an audience of that mm-hmm. kind, especially when you consider that you know platforms can go through short or long-lived fluctuations in how well they allow you to reach your audience, and we're all pretty reliant on some of them to get to our audience. Um, you know, so I think it's a good 
not a hedge, but it's a sensible string to have to your bow. But like you say, very little point making it a, a measurable objective because, you know, history's told us you can't take those subscribers and nurture them into becoming customers. You know, statistically, that doesn't happen at anything like an attractive race. So they're not your buyer. If you look over a 12 month period or a 24 month period, they're not your buyers. So treating them as if they're your buyers probably isn't going to lead to anything. So treat them, you know, with empathy, like you said mm -hmm. earlier. You know, share your content via that channel since they asked for it and don't expect much else. To do all this empathetically and you will most likely have a growing you know bottom of the funnel high intent conversion rate and a growing pipeline as a result anyway so you won't be fretting over the lead score of those people that downloaded your ebook for example no exactly i i think the other thing that probably goes with this is i know i've been banging on about this for years but this is probably the final nail in the coffin for the curated email newsletter unless people are specifically opting into that and specifically you are providing enough value in that. I know, I know that those do exist. You know, there are, there are definitely people who go for specialist curated content. Um, there are people who pay for, uh, there's a, a foodie, a foodie email subscription, like a, like a digest email. Um, it, they pay to be part of it because it's how they learn about the hottest new food trends and things like that. But you've got to provide something that's at that level of value for that to work. If you are not going to be able to put that much value into something that is email only, because you've got other things that you need to work on that are outside of the people who already know you, which I think is most marketers, then I would say automate as much as you possibly can, provide the content that you're already creating, but don't add more to the work that you have to do. Invest your time in creating more value rather yeah. than repurposing to that audience who have already said that they're interested in what you do. Yeah, I agree with all that. I think there are some great newsletters out there, both B2B and B2C. Mm -hmm. um, I was a huge fan of uh, one called A Good Movie to Watch um, and happily paid for that in the past. Um, mm -hmm. They've changed their service, so you'll, you have to use their website now. But um, too often, newsletter is adopted as a solution to a problem, as a, you know, as a, as a fix, a marketing fix, mm -hmm. uh, you know, not because there's a fit between what the company has to say and put into it with ease and, and can do so sustainably and what the audience wants. So, I mean, how many newsletter programs have started and failed quite quickly, you know, when suddenly people across the business aren't available to produce the content for it? I mean, that's just really always sad to see. So mm -hmm. to your point, you're creating content elsewhere. Off, most often, it's, you know, it could be a blog, for example, and you can distribute that automatically. It's relevant. It's interesting. It's not pushy. It's not salesy. And it's probably what got people to subscribe in the first place. So continue down that road, I would say. Mm -hmm. All right. Nothing stands still. Um, and something you made me think about last week was the fact that, you know, this is, uh, you know, a journey. So um, the way it was phrased in our conversation was uh, there's a tide. There's a where are we at on this tide and where is it going? I think is, I think that's how you phrased it. Yeah, I think I mean, there are there's there's a lot in in what we've talked about already. You know, we are very much moving beyond this legalistic view of permission and we you know we as marketers I think we have to embrace this this desire and this tendency in our potential buyers um of of opting out we have to go with this if we if we if if we're not as we say we're fighting we we are we're fighting the force of nature that is people's behavior here um but what what we do by embracing that is move move towards that clearer metric that success metric around creating something that's valuable enough that people remember you for long enough that when it comes to making a buying decision you are one of the people that they think of um where does this take us in the long term it means that every marketer needs to keep an eye on future channels and th and keep thinking about how those behaviors are going to change Right now, we're seeing changes in search behavior that might be temporary or might not with the rise of AI platforms. How is that going to affect 
where people can put marketing content and be discovered that's yet to be found or, or you know truly seen the effects of because people are still testing you know is it going to be something that changes the way that people behave in the way that search engines did or is it going to be something that's only used in certain kinds of scenario it's really it's really all to play for there but we have to embrace where we are now and keep a constant eye to the future um because if we don't we risk not moving with the tide and 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 having even even those moments of resistance um really a lot of this is about moving away from quite an outdated quite a 1950s almost notion um of changing people's behavior re-educating them telling them what we want them to do and then expecting them to do it to understanding their behaviors embracing how they want to behave and going with it um and and ultimately drawing their attention by creating something that's really valuable so yeah i think we can't predict exactly where we're going because we don't know what platforms are coming up next. Um, we don't know whether the platforms we're seeing at the moment will land or whether they might be blips. I think we, we have to assume that they won't. We have to act positively to embrace AI platforms and find ways to be relevant on them. Mm. Um, but we have to yeah just just constantly be looking ahead and all the while making sure that what we're creating is valuable enough that it's being picked up on right now yeah yeah um i think something that dawned on me as a result of this discussion is that perhaps by moving away from quite a large set of volume obsessed models and methods you know where we where we you know pour everything into maximizing impressions and clicks and leads and email sent and engagements and opens and all those things. moving away from those sort of volume obsessed approaches to ones that are obsessed really on quality you know quality of value given quality of buyer experience quality of the ultimate lead that's created you can actually get back to creating volume again because you'll be producing more of those really great fit ideal customers ready to buy you know through empathetic means and good news for those watching you know we have seen you know good success from these sorts of methods you know we've seen a very positive impact from ungating all of our content you know mm -hmm. download is optional subscription is optional you can you can read it freely online that had a positive impact when we did it back in 2017 and um, from live events like this you know we're seeing um you know a variety of positive signs you know not only increased conversations and inquiries you know about people who potentially might want to work with us uh, down at the pipeline level but feedback questions you know uh, positive comments afterwards about good events run that you know have value for people so starting to get some of that qualitative insight that you mentioned earlier simply from putting the topics that we're passionate about out to an audience you know without asking for anything in return. Um, and we're not alone. Uh, customers of Blend see that success too. And there are lots and lots of people talking about their pivot, if you want to call it that, on LinkedIn, uh, you know, from volume-based lead generation plays to more demand creation plays, which are by nature aligned to the opt-out era, or at least can be. Perfect. Well, let's wrap it up there, Amanda. Um, Thank you all for joining us and watching. Be sure to follow the Blend LinkedIn page for our future events. And you can watch this event in due course and all the previous ones um, on our YouTube channel or listen on Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Just search for Demand Decoded and you will find us. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time. Thank you.